Erin Ball speaking. I am white. I have mid-length red hair in a side ponytail and bangs. I'm wearing two Barbie lower leg earrings. I have a purple top with cutouts along the sleeves. I'm in my living room with a busy background. I would like to acknowledge that I'm a colonial settler born here on this traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Ojibwe. Kathy Brandt will share more about this territory, Cataraqui, also known as Kingston. We want to acknowledge that moving forward with justice in mind means learning and remembering the true history of this land, restitution, and creating good connections with indigenous communities who are here today. End of thought. This is Tracy speaking. I'm a white woman with short, dark brown hair and bangs. I am wearing a maroon and black sweater and sitting in my living room. This time last year with Jane Kirby, we were planning a summer circus show, but with all the uncertainty in March, we adapted our plans from movement labs and aerial rehearsals to the online Zoom room. <laughs> we were lucky to be able to still offer amazing labs as a part of our process and share them more widely with artists across virtual space. Thanks to Leah Riddell, who's here in this room today for the ASL for Artists Lab, Lavi Williams, who's also here for her anti-oppression for Performers Lab, and Alex Balmer, who shared blind imaginings with us and consulted with the artists on their pieces. As we continue our process and have continued our process over the summer, we met to discuss our hopes, our access needs, and the stories that we wanted to uncover. The artists then went to work on their own pieces, overlapping to bring artistic elements to one another's work while exploring ways to center access. A big thanks to Josh Lyon for joining the team during the video making phase and to Shan and Alcorn and Alexa Hickox for their video skills. Also Matt Rogalski, who not only did a lot of sound recording, but then also patiently taught me how to master and edit it. We're grateful for Jesse McMillan, who's patiently running this uh, live stream <laughs> and to Carmel, the team's ASL interpreter for being such a skilled support throughout this whole process. We're really grateful for funding from the city of Kingston and the Kingston Arts Council for their support through the OAC uh, and support from the OAC through their recommenders grants. And finally, thanks to the Canada Council for the Arts who made this showing possible through the Digital Originals micro grants. So today we share with you, those out there, way out there, thank you for joining us, the results from this first phase of development. Thanks so much to each of these artists for going through this journey with us. We have learned so much from each of you and we hope that these stories will continue to develop together. End of thought. Erin speaking. Please note that this show engages with intense content matter, including racism, ableism, sanism, autism, and abuse. Please care for yourselves. Our video is just over 90 minutes long with no intermission. There will be a brief question and answer period led by Mariah Horner after the video. Please feel free to send us feedback later as well. There have been a lot of moving parts with this work and we have been collaborating remotely. We have done the best that we can and we also know there are pieces missing. We are confident that many people can have full and powerful experiences of this work as it is. And we also know that it will continue to evolve in future phases. We want to thank and honor all of the people who have done this work and lived these experiences before us and all of the people we have learned from and who have shared with us, including everyone involved in this project. 
Thank you also to closed caption service for our captions. End of thought. Tracy speaking. Kemi King, a part of the artist team and an amazing artistic assistant, has written a spoken word piece in response to the videos created. Please enjoy this intro to the work. And thanks so much for being here. End of thought. Kemi speaking. Um, I am a black woman. I wear glasses. My hair is braided back. Um, I'm wearing a sweater, um, little pot earrings, and I'm gonna make a decently plain background as well. Unidentified illusions, misconnections, soul tied up, breathing in confusion. This is not how we were meant to be. Something is wrong, something I cannot see. Was this caused by me? I hid in the storm before things felt right. I passed over the war. I had to subtract days from night. They are no longer real, not mine. This is not all right. Will you hold me in between time? I miss your hands. What has happened that we cannot touch? I want to know, I want to hear how we have survived. I want to hear how you and I flow into one another. I want to hear your story, to know about those who have come before me. I paved the way. I want to know history. I'm scared, terrified of change, not ready for the challenge, not ready for the stage. I do not want to perform only as a means to conform. I want to defy. I want to be controversy, challenge. I want to impose on you rebirth. I'm only here to confront systems that make me sad, make me mad, make me angry black woman because to you my politic is bad, but I say she is rad, radical. She is witness, impalpable. We will be everything before I am nothing. I continue to hold multitude. I continue to be storm cloud. I continue to be uncovered. End of thought. Kathy Brandt. A Mohawk grandmother with salt and pepper hair, light brown skin, and glasses. She wears a black and white patterned dress with a red shawl covered in colorful flowers, a medicine wheel pin on the collar, and various jewelry, including feather earrings. Kathy holds papers in her hands and gazes at them. Sego sewa kwego skana goaga. Kathy Brandt Young Yucks, Wax Nasare Kenyangehaga, Gendage. Wakunuarado, that means welcome. And I introduce myself in my language because uh, when we introduce ourselves in the language, uh, we call upon the ancestors to come and join us and be with us and guide us as we go about this event. Um, so I just said in my language, I am Grandmother Kathy Brandt from Tyendinaga Mohawk Territory, and uh, I am Bear Clan. And I have papers in my hand because uh, I am a stroke survivor, and uh, so I've had to make friends with paper. <laughs> so today I bring what my people, the Haudenosaunee, call the words before all else, or the Thanksgiving address. I start this in my own language, as I said, as we notify the ancestors. So not just my ancestors, but also yours. They're bringing them along with them. Uh, it is also my practice to advise that if any of you are carrying any burdens, I invite you to leave them for the time being so that you may choose to pick them up uh, later, but I suggest you leave them with Creator. These are words that, are, uh, have been in, that I have been instructed to say before any business uh, shall come to pass where two or more have gathered. They are powerful because they remind us as we give thanks to the people first, because we are the most vulnerable. Creation can get along just fine without us, but without creation, we would cease to exist. Therefore, I stand humble before it. It is our main responsibility to the natural world and creator for its integral part in how we support that web of creation. And so I begin. 
Today, we gather our minds together and offer greetings and thanks to the people. We have been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. And we are grateful that there is still so much love in the world. And now our minds are one. We gather our minds together and offer our greetings and thanks to all the things that are on the earth, all the green and growing things, the medicines, the foods, the plants, trees, shrubs, and grasses, and also to the waters and the life within the waters and our relatives, the animals. And now our minds are one. We gather our minds together and offer our greetings and thanks to all the things in the sky, the birds who sing their beautiful songs, the winds that come from all the four directions, our elder brother, the sun, our grandmother, the moon, and our grandfathers, the thunders, and the stars in the heavens, and now our minds are one. We gather our minds together and offer our most choice greeting and thanks to Singuea Diso, the creator of all things. And this is where I ask that if there is anything that I have forgotten, uh, that you give such greetings and thanks in your own way. And now our minds are one. So now I move on to the land acknowledgement for this area. And today I would like to acknowledge that the land that we stand on has been the site of human activity for time immemorial. It is my understanding that this is the territory that is included in, uh, with the, in the uh, Dish With One Spoon Covenant, Wampum Belt, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Six Nation Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Anishinaabe and Allied Nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes and to ensure that there will be food and resources for generations yet to come. I offer these words in the spirit of this gathering to acknowledge the original caretakers of this land, the Algonquin Anishinaabeg, my people, the Haudenosaunee Six Nations Confederacy, and many other First Nations who have crossed these lands for sustenance, trade, and survival. We also acknowledge and thank our ancestors for continuing to live in a way that ensures that we remember our agreements and responsibilities. I believe it is important to acknowledge and pay respect to ancestral and traditional territories and local Indigenous communities. By doing so, we honor our Indigenous ancestors and current stewards of the land and speak to our spiritual, personal, political, and social relationship with the land and with each other. To be meaningful and respectful, a territorial acknowledgement needs to be intentional. This is the time to give thanks and consider our individual and collective role in the stewardship of Mother Earth and in the building of relationships between Indigenous people and the communities and the rest of the country and Mother Earth. I encourage you all to consider the land that we stand on today and think about how you are in relationship to it. The Kingston Indigenous Communities continues to reflect the areas Algonquin and Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee people, with also significant Métis, Innu and Inuit uh, community and First Peoples from all across Turtle Island, including Mexico and Central America. It is with deep humility that we acknowledge and offer our gratitude for their contributions to this community. Having respect for all as we share this space now and walk side by side into the future. Nyawagoa, thank you. Skana, peace. All my relations. Thank you.
There are more than 100,000 Japanese Canadians in Canada, and about 8,000 Japanese students are studying in Canada. More and more Japanese people will immigrate to Canada in the future. But there are only two cities that have Japanese districts Vancouver and Toronto. There are no Japan towns in other cities. Why? After World War II, living in the trauma of their treatment in Canada, many people in the Japanese community didn't want to be visible. The community spread out as much as possible, and there was a lot of shame around being Japanese Canadian, speaking the Japanese language, and doing cultural activities. Why don't we listen to their hidden voice and uncover their stories? In 1927, Howie Saotoda was born in New Westminster, BC. His Japanese parents ran a successful boarding house. About 22,000 Japanese Canadian people lived in BC at the time. There are various kinds of prejudice and discrimination towards Japanese Canadians, such as limited choice of employment and the denial of the right to vote. But his childhood was very typical. Well, at least it was not worse than his teenage years. On December 7, 1941, when Howie was 14, Pearl Harbor was suddenly and deliberately bombed by Japan. Overnight, the world plunged into World War. Howie's family was labeled enemy aliens by the government and stripped of their rights. Soon after, Canadian Pacific Railways fired all Japanese Canadian people and other industries followed. 1,200 boats were seized. Radios were confiscated because the government was fearful of them being used as a tool to communicate with their enemies. On January 14th, Japanese Canadian males from 18 to 45 years were taken to camps in British Columbia's countryside. Howie's father was forced to work on the Cross Nest Highway. Six weeks later, the remaining 21,000 Japanese Canadians were told to pack a single suitcase. They were taken to camps and towns in the BC interior and put to work. Howie's family was moved to an abandoned mining hotel. Their working and living conditions were harsh. The bathing and laundry facilities were limited. Food conditions were bad, and diarrhea was rampant. With help from indigenous people, they survived in the wild. Indigenous people told them how to get safe water and eat in the wild. On January 19, 1945, the federal government passed a law authorizing the sale of all seized property without the owner's consent. They had left behind luxuries such as beautiful dishes and kimonos when they were taken to camps. When these items were sold, they did not receive the compensation. While living in these camps, families had to fend for themselves and find ways to pay for food and basic supplies. After the war, Japanese Canadians were forced to permanently relocate east of the Rockies or go to Japan. Howie's family decided to relocate to Ontario, where Howie and his parents found work as laborers on a farm near Chatham. Howie worked hard to finish high school and was accepted to Queens. In 1932, Setsuko Nakamura was born in Hiroshima, Japan. Her father ran a food company in California, and her family was quite familiar with Western culture compared to the average family in Japan at the time. Some of her siblings were born in California and enjoyed Western entertainment, 
such as golfing and skiing. Her childhood memories were filled with happiness, but she felt fear for an impending world war. And for her too, in 1941, when she was nine years old, everything around her changed. Food and clothes were rationed. Rice was a luxury item. High heels and skirts were not allowed. Women needed to wear mompe, labor work pants, in case they had to evacuate to an air raid shelter. Nobody could sleep at night. At school, instead of learning in the classroom, everyone had to work. Sitsuko was trained to read code sent from the front line. On August 6, 1945, it was a beautiful morning. She woke up and went to school. Her sister and nephew, who came from the suburbs, were going to see a doctor and to visit the beauty salon in Hiroshima. It was supposed to be a typical day. At 8.15, as she gathered in a large room for her training, suddenly, a bluish-white flash lit up the room from the window. She couldn't hear anything. It was a silent moment. And then, her body was lifted and collapsed into the walls of the building. When she opened her eyes, it was dark and quiet. She was buried in the rubble. She thought she would die. God, help me, she thought. And then, Mom, I'm scared. Everybody was freaking out. It was chaos. Then, somebody put her out from the rubble. What she saw outside the room was worse than a tragedy. People with lost body parts and their skin melted, barely walking and calling for water. The smell of burned bodies. Everything was silent and moved slowly, as if she was watching a silent film. Ten days later, her sister and nephew passed away. They suffered from severe burns. They couldn't eat or drink. There was no medication. Her family couldn't do anything for them, only watch as they lay dying. And then World War II ended on August 15th. In October, school started again. She was happy to meet her friends and study together. However, the fear of after effects began to seize her. People started suffering from diarrhea, bleeding from their gums, losing their hair, and experiencing internal bleeding. If they had any scars, they passed away. Little by little, more and more of her classmates were absent from school. Even Charlie, the teacher told her that they passed away. Her uncle, and aunt passed away like her classmates. Their organs were rotten, melted, and ran through to the bottom of their body. She was scared every morning, fearing that she had internal bleeding and that she would die. She lost nine family members and 351 classmates. After several months, people returned to Hiroshima and it seemed that her life would start again. However, her heart needed much longer to heal. The United States prohibited reports about how cruel the nuclear weapon was. It wasn't until seven years later that Hibakusha survivors finally started talking about their experiences, not only to help heal their emotions, but also to learn how dangerous it is. After studying at Virginia in 1955, she married her Canadian partner in Washington, D.C., because Canadian law banned international marriage with Asians. After she moved to Toronto, the media asked her opinion about the nuclear war. She said that she didn't feel hostility as she did when she was in the U.S., but she found that Canadian ignorance was a problem. Canadian media didn't take any responsibility for the bombing, though uranium from the Northwest Territories was used in the atomic bomb. 
The prime minister of those days, Mackenzie King, had coolly stated that it is fortunate that the use of the bomb should have been upon the Japanese rather than upon the white races of Europe. Now, Setsuko Thurlow is 18 years old, and she continues to dedicate much of her life to warning against the use of atomic bombs while advocating for world peace. This year, she issued an appeal to Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau to publicly acknowledge Canada's extensive participation in creating the atomic bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Prince Takamado was born in Tokyo in 1954. He was the youngest of five with two brothers and two sisters. His childhood was filled with music and sports such as ice hockey and skiing. After graduating from Gakushuin University with a low degree, he came to Canada to study in 1978. He chose Queen's because it was a smaller university and there were few Japanese students. Maybe he was tired of being recognized as a prince. During his time in Kingston, he continued to study law, but he also learned about music and psychology. He became a big fan of the National Ballet of Canada. He loved Inuit sculpture. He enjoyed playing tennis with his friends. He enjoyed his time in Kingston. Though he was supposed to be here for only two years, he extended his stay because he loved Canada so much. After three years at Queen's University, he returned to Japan, but his life was still strongly connected to Canada. In 1983, he became a patron of the Canada-Japan Society, promoting business and cultural links between Canada and Japan. While attending a Canadian embassy event, he met Hisako Tottori for the first time. A month later, they attended a visiting Canadian orchestra concert. Shortly after, they were married and she became Princess Takamado. They visited Canada together six times. In 1992, Queen's University awarded him an honorary degree in recognition of his major contribution to the mutual understanding and appreciation of the cultures of the peoples of Japan and Canada. In 2002, while playing squash with the Canadian ambassador at the Canadian embassy, he collapsed from ventricular fibrillation and passed away. He died at the age of 47. It was too early. Half of his life was dedicated to fostering a strong relationship between Canada and Japan. After his death, Princess Takamado took over the position of a patron of the Canada-Japan Society and visited Canada again and again. His youngest daughter, former Princess Ayako, studied in British Columbia and became the patron after Princess Takamado resigned. As a commemoration of Prince Takamado, a scholarship program was established at the Queen's University. Every year, this scholarship provides a Japanese student with an opportunity to study at Queen's for a year. It's been three years since I came to Kingston. I first came as the Prince Takamado visiting student scholar and studied theater at Queen's. Because I wanted to continue to study theater, I transferred to Queen's and I'm still studying theater now. When walking downtown, most people assume that I'm Chinese. I rarely hear people speaking Japanese. Rather, sometimes people talk to me in languages that I don't understand. It seemed comfortable for me at first, because in Japan, I was told that I wasn't Japanese enough, so I feel like here, I could be anyone. But it was not so. 
I've found that there's no place to belong here. Because you're not trying enough, you'll find somewhere you belong. Join a club. People imply that's all my fault. No matter how I work hard, I'm a foreigner to everyone. I am just that Japanese classmate. I've been surrounded by ignorance and hatred, regardless of whether it's visible or not, or whether it's intended or not. I decided I don't care about it anymore because I will get out of this town sooner or later. And once I leave here, I won't come back. No need for community. This summer, I had to change my plan and stay here because of COVID 19. It's been over a year since I last left Japan. Somehow, I miss Japan. This summer, I found out about an event on August 6th in McBurney Park where they held a Hiroshima commemoration. I went. I didn't see any Japanese people there, but everyone prayed for peace. We wrote a letter to Prime Minister Todo in support of Setsuko Thurlow's appeal. I am impressed that people commemorate and take action for Hiroshima from such a distance. And on August 15th, a Japanese war and anniversary, I made suiton, Japanese flour dumpling soup. I couldn't help it, it was an import, a compulsion. Since I was a small child, My mother has made me this every year to think about those who died and survived World War II. And at this moment, I realize that I am Japanese after all, no matter where I am. If you are invisible to everyone, or your voice cannot reach anyone, I want you to know that I want to hear your story. A Japanese woman with long dark hair is seen from the chest up. Story 4 Chihiro Watanabe. You're probably wondering where I'm, where I'm from, why I look like this, why I have fluorescent bodysuits on, and have big, poofy hair. You're probably wondering why my eyes are black and my lips are silver. I'll tell you. Blackness, black liberation, black history, black futures, black resilience, black joy. Just like looking for. A brown bodysuit in Kingston is really hard. <laughs>、um, however, it wasn't so hard finding a fluorescent suit, fluorescent socks. That's the story of blackness, my story of blackness in Kingston. Being Invisible while hyper visible. Today, in this space, in this circle, I hope to tell a story a story of blackness, which relates to the history, which relates to the present, and it relates to our futures. I want to tell you a secret. I hear you have a balloon nearby. Take the balloon and hold it to your chest throughout the duration of the performance. Maybe you'll feel me. Maybe you'll feel the drums. Possibly your heartbeat. Melt into that. For my performance, you will be hearing a poem being read by myself, Lavi, called Windmills of Your Mind by Alan and Marilyn Bergman.
I spin. I hang upside down. I climb. I hang upside down. Round like a circle in a spiral, like a wheel within a wheel, never ending or beginning on an ever spinning reel, like a snowball down a mountain or a carnival balloon, like a carousel that's turning, running rings around the moon, like a clock whose hands are sweeping past the minutes of its face. And the world is like an apple, whirling silently in space, like the circles that you find in the windmills of your mind. Like a tunnel that you follow to a tunnel of its own, down a hollow to a cavern where the sun has never shone. Like a door that keeps revolving in a half. Forgotten dream, or the ripples from a pebble someone tosses in the stream, like a clock whose hands are sweeping past the minutes of its face, and the world is like an apple whirling silently in space, like the circles that you find in the windmills of your mind. Keys that jingle in your pocket, words that jangle in your head. Why did summer go so quickly? Was it something that you said? Lovers walking along a shore, and leave their footprints in the sand. Is the sound of distant drumming just the fingers of your hand? Pictures hanging in a hallway, and the fragment of a song. Half remembered names and faces, but to whom do they belong? When you knew that it was over, you were suddenly aware. That the autumn leaves were turning to the texture of her hair, like a circle in a spiral, like a wheel within a wheel, never ending or beginning, on an ever spinning reel, as the images unwind, like the circles that you find in the windmills of your mind. I am still. Flat on the ground, eyes wide, mouth open, eyes closed. Liz, a deaf white actor with mid-length, dirty blonde hair. Floats in the lower right section of the screen. She translates spoken words using American Sign Language. Behind Liz is a black screen with captions of the words being spoken. This is Aaron Ball speaking. Content warning: institutional abuse, ableism, ableist language, sanest language. I am white. The following is based on my lived experience as a white person benefiting from living in a white supremacist society. I think it is imperative to note that the violence that Black and Indigenous folks experience, relating to the carceral system and the medical-industrial complex, is intense and ongoing. Their stories are crucial stories to remember, to learn from. And for which we should continue to seek justice. Behind Liz is a photo of a portion of a limestone brick colonial building. There are several long and thin windows with rounded tops and an old-fashioned light fixture. Rockwood Asylum and Penrose Building. In the late 1800s, under Sir John A. Macdonald's governing. 
imprisoned people at the Kingston Penitentiary were forced to build the Rockwood Asylum. The Rockwood was built for those perceived to have mental health differences, including wandering, showing emotion, performing actions that were deemed illegal, and promiscuity. A splice of red aerial fabric hangs from above. Inside, a figure moves. Hands press into fabric from within. Pressing hands continue. The fabric is suspended above the ground like a closed hammock or a contained prison. Hands pushing. Grasping, pushing, and closed. Fleeting glimpses, white skin, frantic movement. Feet, press into fabric. Sir John A. Macdonald had decided that prisoners in the Kingston Penitentiary needed to be separated, so women were moved to the new location and kept in horse stables for years before the building was even complete. In the background, black and white photos of the limestone Rockwood Penrose building continue to cycle throughout the piece. In the horse stables, there was minimal contact with humans, the cells were nine feet by five feet, and food was shoved in through a slit in the door. Ironically, the beds were made of straw. Red fabric hangs, movement within, on the left side of the screen. Alexa, a deaf white actor with mid-length light brown hair, signs the following words insane criminal mad hysteria lunatic crazy idiot the people at rockwood wore canvas clothing with the word lunatic printed on it many so-called treatments were administered to those who were locked up the treatments included sedatives, bloodletting, leeching, enemas, blistering, restraints, and shock treatment.
Through my research, I found claims that some of the first experimental lobotomy surgeries were performed at the Rockwood, as well as testing masturbation preventative devices. Shock treatment and restraints still occur today. People are forced to undergo horrific and traumatic procedures that wipe out their memories. I know this because it happened to me. I have been locked up many times in mental institutions and so-called correctional facilities. I was locked up on the same property where the Rockwood building is for almost a year. I have been researching for months and have found newspaper articles detailing experiences of authors' family members who were at Rockwood. But the first actual patient record that I came across of a person who had been held at the Rockwood was an account of someone who had frozen their feet. Trees and snow, momentarily seen in the background. Prone to wandering, and wandered off and froze their feet, it said. I also wandered off and froze my feet. Aaron, white, tattoos, mid-length red hair, and lower legs that end below the knees. She is on the ground inside a net that hangs from above, wearing a beige bodysuit she looks naked. She rolls and claws, continuously moving inside the net. The Rockwood closed its doors in the early 1900s, and it reopened with a different name, the Penrose Building, and was labeled as a residence for disabled people. Sir John A. MacDonald, though no longer governing, had a disabled daughter, which makes this whole story that much more baffling, considering the building was in place because of him. The first of these institutions in Ontario where people who were identified as developmentally disabled were locked up was called the Aurelia Asylum for Idiots. There was no private space anymore. People usually arrived when they were young, and parents were then discouraged from visiting, leaving those who were locked up abandoned. Much abuse occurred in the Penrose building. Physical, psychological, emotional, and sexual abuse, both by others who were locked up and employees. Penrose was closed in the year 2000, and the government of Ontario offered money to those who were in the institution, though it denies all claims of abuse. Aaron continues to roll, trapped in the net. In the fall of 1976 and winter 1977, I worked as a medical lab technologist at the Kingston Psychiatric Hospital. Um, I, part of my duties were to take blood, and that meant sometimes having to go over to the Penrose building, where there were people that had been identified as developmentally disabled and were locked up on the wards. So we would receive a call the day before, and we'd make an appointment because Someone had to meet us at the door and unlock all the further doors to let us in. Um, when I went there this one particular morning, the uh, orderlies greeted me with wide grins and I got to the men's floor and um, there were men walking around totally naked and the person who needed their blood taken was totally naked and he was being held down in his bed. and. Um, so I took his blood, and the building also had women, floors of women, that you could hear their screams, and we would have to take their blood when they were held down. Aaron continues to roll, trapped in the net.
That was my mom. End of current thought. Aaron stands behind the net, wearing prosthetic lower legs. Arms up, she grabs the net. Upside down, legs wide. She climbs up the net, upside down. Sideways. She weaves the net between her legs. It is clunky with her prosthetic legs. Upside down, she hangs by her thighs. She holds the net below. down, crescent moon shape. She spins slowly. Wraps net around legs. Again, it gets caught momentarily on her legs. Net around waist. She slowly rolls down to the ground. End. Hello, my name is Teresa Upton. My sign name is... I am a white woman in my 50s. I have shoulder length hair. I wear glasses and a black shirt. My name is Elizabeth Morris. My sign name is... I am white with mid-length, dirty blonde hair, wearing a dark top. My name is Alexa. My sign name is... I am a young, white woman with mid-length, light brown hair and a gray top. In the United States of America, in the early 1800s, there is an island called Martha's Vineyard. Back then, trains and planes were not used to travel. Most would only travel by boat. Not a lot of traveling happened, and so that meant that everyone who lived on the island were all living together. This led to cousins marrying each other and resulted in a high percentage of deafness amongst the population. Everyone on the island spoke sign language, both deaf and hearing. You were not able to identify whether a person was deaf or hearing. There was one family in England with multi-generational deafness, which meant they had a number of members of the family who were deaf. Initially, when they moved to the U.S., they lived in Massachusetts, with some of them eventually moving to Martha's Vineyard, which caused the number of deaf people on the island to increase even more. Most people on the island were members of one of these two dominant families. The sign language used in Martha's Vineyard had an enormous influence on what we know as ASL today. In the 1800s, there was a gentleman named Thomas Hopkins Gallaudet. He was training to be a minister, and he decided to visit some family in Hartford, Connecticut. He saw some siblings playing outside in the yard and noticed a little girl, Alice Cogswell. He noticed she was not playing with the other kids, and he went to her to chat. She didn't understand what he was saying, and he realized she was deaf. 
he decided he would try to gesture with her and write words out in the sand with a stick. He would point to things and write out the names of those things in the sand so she could learn them. Her father, surgeon Dr. Mason Cogswell, noticed how interested Gallaudet was in teaching his daughter. The two of them decided it would be a good idea to establish a school for the deaf, but did not know enough about deaf education. Gallaudet knew of a school in the UK called Braidwood Academy Oral School. It was decided that Gallaudet would travel to the UK for three years to observe and learn what he needed to set up the school in the United States. He traveled to the UK but was not impressed with what he saw because of the dominant oral education and no use of sign language. At that time, wealthier families would send their deaf children away to oral schools to be educated. But Dr. Mason Cogswell did not want to send his daughter, Alice, away. He wanted her to stay home. Gallaudet met a man named Abbé Sicard, who worked at the School for the Deaf in Paris, France. He also met one of his deaf students, Laurent Clerc. He was a teacher for the deaf and supported the use of sign language in the classroom to teach deaf children. Abbé Sicard encouraged Gallaudet to go to Paris to observe their approach and to learn how to teach deaf students in sign language. Gallaudet joined them in Paris to observe the National School for the Deaf. He realized, though, that he could only afford to stay for two months. Thinking about LSF, Langue des Signes Française, and French education, it would be impossible to learn both languages in that short time and tried to figure out what to do. He decided to make an agreement with Clerc, who was a good teacher and deaf himself, to accompany him back to America. Clerc would join him to help him establish the School for the Deaf in the USA. They agreed and sailed back to America. Gallaudet would teach Clerc English, and in return, Clerc would teach Gallaudet LSF. Once they arrived in America, they raised enough money to establish the school. It was called the Connecticut Asylum for Education and Instruction for Deaf and Dumb Persons in Hartford, Connecticut. The school opened in 1817. Deaf children came from Martha's Vineyard and all over the USA. As a result, MVSL was brought to the school as well as other children bringing their own home signs that they grew up using. In addition, the influence of Clerc and his use of LSF. A combination of all these signed languages made what we know today as American Sign Language, ASL. In 1864, American President Abraham Lincoln signed a bill into law allowing the opening of a college for deaf people to obtain their degree. That led to Edward Minor Gallaudet to establish a national college for the deaf and mute. In 1887, women were allowed to attend the college. In 1894, the name changed to Gallaudet College. In 1880, the National Association of the Deaf held a conference to discuss deaf education and deaf community needs. Deaf people from all over the U.S. traveled to attend the conference held in Ohio. Ironically, around the same time in 1880, there was another conference being held focusing on deaf education. This conference was being held in Milan, Italy. The conference was called the Second International Congress on Education of the Deaf. And oddly, many deaf teachers did not know about the Congress even though they were talking about deaf education. Many educators, non-deaf teachers, supported oral education at that time. There was much debate and discussion about establishing more oral schools and changing existing schools for the deaf to oral schools. Thomas and Edward Gallaudet, father and son, both went to the Congress trying to convince everyone otherwise by advocating for the continued use of sign language in the schools. Unfortunately, the majority voted in favor to eliminate sign language from the schools. That caused the widespread of oralism and had a huge impact globally with negative effects on deaf education everywhere for over a hundred years because of that conference. 
One of the strongest supporters of the oralist method was A.G. Bell, Alexander Graham Bell. At the time, he was very well known as the inventor of the telephone. His father strongly supported oralism, as did he. His mother, Eliza, was deaf and used sign language to communicate with Bell. A.G. Bell also married a deaf woman named Mabel, and they would speak to each other to communicate. A.G. Bell felt that sign language should not be used and only to communicate orally. He felt that deaf people needed to do this in order to assimilate with society. He didn't believe deaf people should socialize with other deaf people and felt it was necessary to force them to live as a hearing person by following the oralist approach. He also didn't support the idea of deaf clubs, thinking it would cause deaf people to not socialize within the hearing world. He also didn't support the idea of deaf people marrying each other, fearing it would cause higher procreation of more deaf people. Ironically, while he was spreading the word about his theory and beliefs, he went to Martha's Vineyard. Through his research, which he did secretly, he learned that the majority of deaf people are born to hearing parents. It was the opposite of what he was preaching to the public, and he kept this information to himself in order to support his claims that deaf must marry hearing, must be oral, and that deaf people shouldn't socialize with each other. Because of what happened in Milan, ratifying that the oral method should be used to educate deaf children and not use sign language. There was an enormous impact on deaf education globally for over a hundred years, shaking up deaf communities everywhere. As a result, deaf teachers were fired from the schools for the deaf as well as deaf staff. They were replaced with hearing teachers and staff to teach deaf children using the oralist approach. If deaf children tried to sign in class, they would be physically punished, abused. Children lost the use of sign language, lost their natural first language. Many students struggled to keep up learning orally, which led to language deprivation. Language deprivation leads to effects on mental health and other long-term negative effects for the rest of their lives. For many years, Gallaudet University always had a male, non-deaf individual as the president of the university. Things changed in 1988 when the university was ready to appoint a new president. The university selected a hearing woman to fill the position. The deaf community felt it was time for change. Enough is enough. They didn't want a hearing person making decisions on their education. It was time to have a deaf president now. The community revolted and held protests against the university. The movement was called Deaf President Now. During those protests, the black community loaned the famous banner from Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream. Finally, Gallaudet University realized the community was right and their desire to have a signing deaf president was important. They appointed the first deaf president at the university, I. King Jordan. He became our Gallaudet University's first deaf president in history. Deaf history in schools. The deaf school in Belleville, called the Ontario School for the Deaf, was established in 1870. They had sign language at the school and had vocational training for students. For example, at that time, a good number of people worked on farms tending to livestock in fields. The boys would learn the skills necessary to work on the farm. The girls would learn skills like sewing, cooking, and other aspects of running a household. That was vocational training. This was until 1880, when the vote in Milan banned the use of sign language in the schools. This had an effect worldwide and the Belleville School banned the use of sign language in 1923 and adopted the oral method. Deaf teachers at the school were getting laid off one by one and only hearing teachers were being hired to teach using the oral method at the school for the deaf.
students would learn academic subjects such as history, mathematics, reading, etc. with the oral approach. Without the use of sign language, students were becoming more and more delayed in their learning, missing a lot of vital information. In the 1950s, the Rochester method was adopted, which is fingerspelling all the words out while speaking at the same time. This caused language gaps in the students' learning. In the 1980s is when I entered the school for the deaf. At that time, they started using the total communication approach in the schools. This is when you talk in sign at the same time, which is challenging because of the different structure of the languages. Many students still struggled because although better than previous methods, it still caused language deprivation. This was until the 1990s when the bilingual, bicultural approach was adopted, which means the language of instruction was sign language. Students would learn writing skills but still be able to communicate using sign language. This approach was the most successful. Students were able to learn English and sign. Teachers started to wonder about deaf students' literacy level being so low compared to other students at a grade four level. They soon realized the teacher signing proficiency was low at a grade four level, which impacted the students' learning. In actuality, the students had the intellectual capacity, but their English proficiency was low. On average, students would not achieve higher than a grade four reading level to no fault on their part. The first school for the deaf in Toronto was established in 1924, called the Clinton Street Public School. Then, in 1931, the King Edward Public School established a preschool. So, there were two deaf programs. Eventually, the programs moved to Sunnyview. In 1953, the Sunnyview program grew to six deaf classes. They would share resources amongst the classes, but there were too many students to support. As a result, they established the MTSD, Metropolitan Toronto School for the Deaf. MTSD was paired with Davisville Junior School. Half the school was Davisville, hearing students, and the other half, fully deaf school, was MTSD. The new MTSD building was established in 1962. At the beginning, most of the students were oral, later changing to the Rochester method in the 70s, eventually changing to the bye-bye approach, allowing signing while learning written English. Speech therapy was also included as well. In the 1980s is when they finally allowed sign language as a language of instruction in the school. In my time at school, we were permitted to sign and use it in the classroom. Before that, though, I attended an oral school first. At this school, it was more oral communication with not a lot of signing. The reason I transferred was because other kids were transferring over, and I was curious about MTSD. I thought I would check it out and felt it suited me better. I was born deaf. How did my parents find out? My parents brought me home from the hospital. They would listen for crying. Babies cry when they are hungry, need a change, etc. My crying would be different. I would cry if I was hungry or scared, but they noticed something was missing. When a loud noise was made, they looked over at me and noticed that's what was missing. They brought me to a doctor to get checked. They suspected I was deaf because my reactions were different and they felt like something was missing. The doctor assured them that it was common and many babies react that way. When I was one year old, I wouldn't respond when my parents called me or to anything they were saying. My parents suspected I was deaf because of that. They brought me to see the family doctor again. At first, they just thought I was being a lazy hearing kid. When I was two years old, my parents couldn't stand it anymore. High pitched screaming and crying. They decided to go see the doctor again, and this time I would see the audiologist to confirm that I was in fact deaf. I went through some tests, and there were instructions for the machine with the buttons. I would have to look at the patterns and memorize. They assumed I followed her instructions, but I would just memorize what they did, so I passed all the tests. They told my parents I was hearing. My mom still felt that there was something off. 
By the time I was three, my mother had decided she was done with the local doctors in the area. My parents decided to fly to Toronto from New Brunswick, where I lived, and go to the sick kids' hospital. That's when she learned that I was deaf. I eventually graduated, but on my report card it said I had a grade 4 literacy level. When I went out in the real world, I attended the Vocational Rehabilitation Services, VRS. I was chatting with someone I knew and mentioned that I always wanted to become a nurse, but people thought I couldn't. They said I would find it hard because of my literacy level. I had an interpreter there with me at the time. I knew a lot of information, so I couldn't understand how that is possible. They sent me to explore other job possibilities like working in the post office, etc. I didn't have an interpreter, so I would have to figure things out on my own. For example, the post office, nursing, and other kinds of employment opportunities. One program had a requirement for a grade 11 literacy level. Other programs only required grade 8, 9, So I read through all the material and understood it all. Afterwards, I went through all of the tests and passed. Then afterwards, I had to go and chat with someone. They informed me I wasn't at a grade 4 literacy level. I was actually at 11 or 12. I was told my reading level was a lot lower, and they told me not to worry. What's important is that I understand the material. So I asked if I was permitted to go into nursing school, and they said yes and fully supported it. I started the nursing program and I worked hard. The textbooks were so expensive, I couldn't afford to purchase them. I had to figure out something to do. I ended up borrowing the instructor's medical dictionary. I worked really hard. My friend, who I'm still friends with to this day, agreed to take notes for me during class. Back then, we didn't have computers readily available to us. We had to do things the old-fashioned way. I bought carbon paper for my friend to use, you know, the kind with three layers of paper, yellow, pink, and white. My friend would take notes, and after class, they would give me a copy of them. We would go over the information together until I understood the information. If I didn't understand, I would have to memorize the information for the tests, but most of the time I understood. The teacher accepted that if we had to write an essay, I hated writing essays, I was allowed to bring in an interpreter so I could sign my answers, which made sense. So I would record my answers on VHS, the technology we would use in my day, when I would write a test, the teacher would check over my answers and then we would meet in person. I would clarify in ASL any answers that were unclear in writing and would pass the tests. I eventually graduated. It was cool because three teachers who knew me when I applied came up to me at my graduation. At the time, they didn't want me to enroll in the program because I am deaf. They couldn't say it was because I was deaf, but their concern was the communication aspect. So what I did was, during college, I'd volunteer, which helped a lot. I was able to volunteer at hospitals, nursing homes, etc. And so, I set up a meeting with the three teachers from that college, and with support, I asked them, Why did you dismiss me years ago? And they said, well, it's because of the communication problem. And I told them that I volunteered at all these different places and nursing homes and hospitals and gained a lot of experience. I made a deal with them to give me a one-month trial to see if I could manage, and if I could, to permit me to enter the program full-time. The three of them deliberated and decided to give me a chance. I worked hard. I wanted to prove to them that I could do it. I got through the month and they allowed me to enroll in the program full-time. I went through the program, borrowing their medical dictionary, as I mentioned before, I couldn't afford them. On graduation day, when the three of them came up to me, carrying a box and called the interpreter over, and they said, you know, thank you. You taught me so much, and I've learned so much about deaf people from you. And it was a pleasure getting to know you. 
We also realize that there is no difference between deaf and hearing students, and really, there are different ways to communicate. That is the key. This gift is from the three of us to you, and I was just completely shocked and very touched. And the gift that they gave me was a medical dictionary. It was beautiful, and all three of them signed it. And this beautiful gesture just meant so much to me, and I still have it to this day. I was born in England. When I was an infant, my mom took a look at me and she thought, something's off because they would call my name and I wouldn't look over, and they thought maybe I was deaf. I have an older brother who is hard of hearing, so my parents already had experience with this. They brought me to the doctor's office and my parents told them they suspected their daughter is deaf, just like her older brother. The doctor went behind me and clapped their hands and I would look over and the doctor said, She's fine. She's hearing. My parents trusted what the doctor said to them. We then moved to Japan. At that time, I was having some stomach problems. So we went to see the doctor, and they asked, How much medication have you given her? And my parents told them the number, and that was enough for my age. They did a full checkup, and they tested my hearing, and they confirmed that I was, in fact, deaf. My parents were not surprised, really, because they kind of suspected all this time, despite what the doctors said. But to have that confirmation, they still had a little bit of shock. We moved back to England and then to the States. And at that time, my mom was looking for a school for my sister, my hearing older sister. She started chatting with the principal, and they looked over and asked my mom if I was deaf, noticing my behavior, further explaining that I had an older brother who is hard of hearing. The principal explained there is another school which has a deaf program within a mainstream school and suggested it may be good for me to go to that school. My mom put me in that school with the deaf program. They didn't realize that the teacher signed and would speak and sign at the same time. This is called C, S-E-E, -E, Signed Exact English. When I arrived home, I would sign and talk at the same time. I was starting to develop my language. My mother contacted the teacher and asked them to teach her sign language so she could communicate with her daughter. During our time in Ohio, my mother had her fourth child. My oldest brother is hard of hearing. My oldest sister is hearing. I was the third born and am deaf. When my younger brother was born, they found out he was also deaf and has autism. When I was eight or nine, we moved to Ontario, Canada because of my father's job. I went to the school for the deaf in Belleville, now called Sir James Whitney, when I was eight years old. All the staff, the teachers, were hearing. But over time, they started hiring more and more deaf teachers and deaf EAs. And I saw they're just like me. It was great to see deaf role models out in the community, and I was able to better understand my deaf identity. I think that's very important for deaf children to have deaf adult role models. I attended a mainstream high school, and I was the only deaf student there. This was a high school in Kingston, Ontario. They hired an interpreter, and this first interpreter was not skilled, only knowing a little bit of sign language. They weren't certified or even qualified to work in that school setting. I couldn't understand them when they signed, and I had to put up with it for three years, and it was an issue. I ended up falling really behind in my studies compared to my peers because I couldn't understand what was happening in the classroom. Finally, they hired a qualified interpreter in my final two years of high school, and this person was a CODA, CODA, Child of Deaf Adults, and so sign language was a natural language. They knew about the deaf community, deaf culture, and signed fluently. She did her job well, and I thrived when she was working there. My grades started improving right away, and that says a lot. Accessibility is important for deaf education and any education for deaf people. I decided after high school to go to Gallaudet University, and I had such great memories there. I felt like it was like the Wizard of Oz, so different than the world with all the hearing people and people talking. When I walked into Gallaudet, it was like I followed the yellow brick road. I ended up in this wonderful land where everyone could communicate in the same language, that it was a world that I felt at home and where I belonged. 
I studied two majors, elementary education and theater education, and I graduated with a BA, and I felt very honored. When I left Gallaudet University, it was back to the real world where everyone was hearing and there weren't a lot of deaf folks, and it was very depressing. The hearing world is not accessible to deaf people, and you were not around a lot of other deaf folks. There are some fortunate people who maybe go to the school for the deaf or they encounter other deaf people, but it doesn't happen all of the time. And it does have a huge impact, and it had a huge impact on me. That's when I decided to get involved in deaf theater. I was involved in two theater groups, Quest for Arts in Washington, D.C., with both hearing and deaf actors, and the National Theater of the Deaf in Hartford, Connecticut, which also had both hearing and deaf actors. Here in Canada, we don't have a national deaf theater company. There used to be one back in the day, but not anymore. In Kingston, three of us started a theater group called Deaf Spirit Theater, with a fourth person who is our stage manager and video editor. We've been established since 2015, and since then we've added three more people to our group, two male actors and an assistant stage manager. Deaf Spirit Theater is just growing. We need that kind of interaction, working off each other's energy, using sign language. We also want to become role models. We want to be role models for deaf youth, to educate parents of deaf children. We want to show deaf kids what they can do and demonstrate what inclusive theater looks like. Our performances are in ASL with interpretations and sometimes captions as well. For my graduate studies, I went to OCAD University and I studied inclusive design in theater spaces. I feel that I wanted to help live theater become more inclusive to deaf and hard of hearing people. That program was perfect because my thesis focused on creating accessible live theater space for deaf, hard of hearing, and their friends and families. And in 2017, I graduated with my master's degree in inclusive design. I was born deaf, but my parents didn't realize it right away. We moved to Montreal for a little while, just one year. My parents noticed I wasn't responding to noises, and they suspected that I was deaf. My mother brought me to the doctor, and they confirmed that I was deaf. They looked for resources for what to do, how to make things accessible for me, and how to teach their child. So they decided that I would do both, learn to sign, and also go through speech therapy. Before I reached seven years old, I was very laid back, learning speech therapy, and I didn't really think about language. But by not having limits put on me, my communication was opened up to whatever method best suited me. For me, I think that I didn't feel that there were barriers because they were very open-minded. Everyone was open to learning how to communicate with me. And I realized that I could sign, sure, I knew a little bit of sign before I was seven, but I didn't really understand fully that it was another language. I was able to both learn sign language and speech. I really had the experience of both worlds. MTSD was a great experience, having ASL storytelling and ASL theater. There was a lot of ASL in the curriculum at that time. So we would go to speech therapy, have access in our classroom, and there were a lot of resources available to us. Our age group was fortunate to access both resources. I was still able to do speech therapy and sign language. My parents weren't forced to put me in speech therapy. It was an option, but it was not a requirement. I would go to speech therapy once a week. I'd miss class and go for speech therapy and then go back to class. MTSD and the other school, Davis School, would integrate the hearing and deaf students for some classes. For example, we would have our gym class together with both deaf and hearing. It was kind of like our rehearsal for functioning in the hearing world, and I was able to socialize with hearing kids. From grade seven and grade eight, my teachers wanted us to have better resources, better access, I guess. So they decided to take our class to a different school. So we had MTSD and we went down the road. 
walking over to Hudson School. And we were involved in a science class, mathematics, and a history class, I believe, with hearing students. It was mainstream, basically, but all of the deaf students attended together, so we had each other to communicate with. We also had an interpreter there. It was really helpful for us to be able to learn how to socialize and communicate and see what the hearing world looks like. In the afternoon, we would have classes with only the deaf students, so we headed back to MTSD for those classes. We would actually have our social events together, like school dances and field trips. Another good experience with MTSD was the sporting events. We would compete against the Belleville School for the Deaf, EC Drury in Milton, and Robarts in London, Ontario. And that was where one time we played handball and several different tournaments. It was great. Everyone was deaf there, learning about the deaf community and deaf culture, and you could communicate with everyone. A lot of deaf awareness. We would go to Milton to play hockey, and I think we went to Belleville for volleyball at one time. It was a great opportunity to socialize in the deaf community. I was fortunate that I was able to have my class that I went to school with. I wasn't lonely. We had each other and went through everything together. It was just a great experience. We had a big group when we graduated, and the next class was fairly big as well. But the class sizes eventually started getting smaller and smaller every year. The programs eventually moved to Fairwood, and they closed down my school in 2012. After MTSD, I went to another school that had a deaf program with a mainstream class. I had some classes with just other deaf students, and some classes integrated with hearing kids. They also had interpreters there. It was fully accessible, and I had a great experience in high school. When I went to OCAD University, there were no other deaf students. There could have been in other programs, but I was the only deaf student in my class. I just focused on my studies. A great place to go if you want to be in an environment with a deaf community is RIT. Rochester Institute of Technology. I have one friend who attended RIT to be in a deaf community environment. They have great events, and a lot of deaf students go, and it's a great experience visiting the campus. When I visited, I was able to meet a whole bunch of different people from different states, internationally as well, and I learned a lot about deaf culture. Those were positive years during my time at OCAD University. I was at a hearing college, sure, but I was able to experience RIT as well. It helps that I live in a city. I have a lot of friends here, and once I was done my classes, I could go and hang out with my deaf friends, so it wasn't always lonely. Sometimes I do feel lonely, but I do make friends, and I have some really close friends. Three close friends, one who is now becoming my roommate. When I graduated from OCAD, I went to York University for my master's, and they have some deaf classes and ASL classes there, so there were more deaf students there. I met a few friends, and it was cool, but it was different because I worked from home most of the time. I wasn't required to go to campus for my courses. After one year, it wasn't really enough time to really get to know anyone too well. But I still have my friends in my community and my focus on making films. So, you know, that! Are we the barriers towards deafness? No, it's society. We need to break down barriers. Like that example that Teresa spoke about. They almost didn't let her into the nursing program. All she wanted to do was learn how to become a nurse. Why were they posing barriers for her? But then she was the one who had to prove them wrong. And they finally let those barriers down. And she succeeded. So really, who creates the barriers? Is it us? Or is it you? Or is it society? Is it people? Is it the system? So think about it. I was fortunate that I didn't have a lot of barriers because they didn't give me a lot of barriers. They allowed me to learn and gain experience. They provided interpreters. They gave me access. They gave me note takers. They gave me what I needed. That's how it should be. Provide us with accessibility.
Like a storm cloud bringing change. Inspired by Joan Kuyek's time in Kingston. A white woman hangs by one arm from a rope in front of a construction site. She proceeds to perform acrobatic movements on the rope and handstands around town. Like a storm cloud bringing change. 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 Development was foolish, and you knew that even then. Power and property were the culprits. Organizing the strategy tested when they sent you to Kingston. And little did they know that this community project would change the whole damn show. Educated by the shipyard women on Lower Union Street, you believed that together the people couldn't be beat, fighting for the tenants, Fighting for the youth, fighting for the future, you fought for the truth. Like a storm cloud bringing change, like a storm cloud bringing change, like a storm cloud bringing change, like a storm cloud bringing change. Like a storm cloud bringing change 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 They'd seize your stuff, they'd throw you out, they'd kick you to the curb. But you challenged landlords' power, people's dignity preserved. Petitions and rent strikes, a movement you helped birth. You took a seat at their table, but what was it all worth? Rocking City Hall with your controversial feminist views, you made this place more livable when you fought to change the rules. Anything that's worth anything is worth fighting for. And we need to know what it took if we want anything more. Like a storm cloud bringing change. Let it blow. Let it thunder. Let it rain. The woman hangs by one arm. A sunburst behind her. This piece was inspired by Joan Kuyek, who was an organizer in Kingston in the late 1960s. Joan was a founding member of ATTAC, Association for Tenants Action Kingston, which fought for tenants' rights, rent control, and better housing, and which had significant public support. As part of that work, Joan was elected to city council, where she was the only female alderman. She quit after a motion calling for rent control was voted down and, facing protest, council was forcibly adjourned. Joan's work did contribute to the passing of the Landlord and Tenant Act in Ontario, which secured some basic rights for tenants. Joan is a lifelong organizer who has continued to be involved in many movements and is well known as the co-founder of Mining Watch Canada. Today, Kingston continues to face a housing crisis. In 2018, the vacancy rate was just 0.6%, the lowest in Ontario. In 2020, a tent city in Bell Park was forcibly evicted, leaving many without shelter or community. This video was shot in locations highlighting some of those responsible for today's housing crisis. When I spoke to Joan, she told me that we need to understand our histories and remember that even the smallest victories were fought for by someone. 
This video is dedicated to all those fighting for better affordable housing, past, present, and future. So my name is Jessica Rivera Balsham. I am here standing in front of a traditional drum from Mexico. Uh, this is called a Tlalpan Huehue. Um, so it's hand carved out of a beautiful pine tree that's uh, specifically found in Chihuahua, Mexico. Um, and it has uh, a beautiful mule skin on it and a woven um, sachet of sorts uh, around it as well and it has uh you know it's very tall up to my my hip length and there's the thunderbolt lightning carves that are within um and i'm standing here with a with a traditional dress from oaxaca mexico and a beaded um necklace that has some medicines inside and it's brightly colored and i also have a sachet that my cousin gifted from me uh, again, from, from Mexico. Um, I have semi-dark skin. I have lots of freckles. Uh, I have long-ish long hair that's kind of brown. Um, and I'm happy to be here. Piali piali quali tonali, no no toca yesica, no toca tonal, o se pasiwat, neniwala tenochtitlan celaya guanajuato mexico. So my name is Jessica Rivera Balsham. I'm very grateful to be here um, and to be a part of this collaborative project. Um, this piece is in honoring, this is um, a song that I, I tend to share when being a part of the vigil for missing and murdered indigenous women, um, girls and two-spirit people. And for this song, it's very much in connection to loss of individuals, loved ones that have passed away. It's also about the, the grieving process and the loss of different transitions in life. And similarly to these days, um, as the impact of COVID-19 and all the lives that have been lost as well. It's honoring all of those around the world that have been impacted and lives lost. So this is in connection to all of our ancestors, in connection to all people around the world and uh, honoring all those that have gone before us.
ti. Credits. Alex Bomer, Access Consultant. Alexandra Hickox, Storyteller and ASL Interpretation for Chihiro Watanabe, Aaron Ball, Jessica Rivera Belsham. Videography for Deaf Spirit Theater Piece and Video Editing. Carmel Cachero, ASL Interpretation During the Labs, Translation and Captions for Deaf Spirit Theater's Piece. Chihiro Watanabe, Storyteller, Videography for Her Piece. David Parker, Sound Technician for Jane Kirby's Piece. Elizabeth Morris, Storyteller and ASL Interpretation for Aaron Ball, Aaron Ball, Aerial Artist, Aerial Hoop Coach, Access Director, Voice of Elizabeth Morris, and Co-Producer. Jill Gillina, Photography for Aaron Ball's Piece. Jane Kirby, Aerial Artist and Hand Balancer, Poem and Spoken Word, Assistant Producer. Josh Lyon, Videography and Captions. Kathleen Ruck, Penrose Interview in Aaron Ball's Piece. Kathy Brandt, Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving Address. Kemi King, Artistic Assistant and Voice for Teresa Upton. Lavi Williams, Aerial Hoop Artist and Spoken Poem. Lyrics by Alan Bergman and Marilyn Bergman. Matt Rogalski, Sound Recording. Natasha Courage Bacchus, ASL Interpretation for Lavi Williams. Shan Alcorn, Videography for Jane Kirby's Piece. Tracy Guptel, Fabric Artist, Sound, Director of the Co-Laboratory, Voice of Alexandra Hickox, Co-Producer. Teresa Upton, Storyteller and ASL Interpretation for Jane Kirby and Kathy Brandt. Jessica Rivera Belsham, Storyteller, Vocals and Percussion. Many thanks to all of our sponsors, Kingston Arts Council, the City of Kingston, Canada Council for the Arts, Ontario Arts Council, Tangled Arts, Nightwood Theatre, and Theatre Kingston. With thanks to Joan Kuyek, Cyrus Marcus Ware, Jesse McMillan, Mariah Horner, Sue Baisley, Molly Mask, Leah Riddell, Becky Gold, and all of our lab participants. This has been a co-production of Anarch Theatre, Kingston Circus Arts, and Circus Kingston Collective. Thanks to Deaf Spirit Theatre, Undivided Production, AllIn.ca, Lowlit Aerial Arts. This is a learning process and we are doing our best, but we may have made mistakes. Please let us know if we said anything hurtful. If you are an artist involved in the show, I now invite you to turn on your video if you're comfortable to do so for our question and answer period. If you're an invited guest in the Zoom call that is not an artist involved, we ask that you keep your video off until our feedback session starts around uh, 7.55. So hello folks, my name is Mariah Horner. My pronouns are she and her. I'm a white woman with brown hair in a high ponytail and clear framed glasses uh, with a light purple sweater that says abolition is creative in small white text on the front. And I'm joining you here from my apartment in so-called Kingston, Ontario. Thank you for coming to this session. It is a live streamed question and answer period with the artists present. So grateful to share this space with all of you. So thank you and welcome to the artists that are present. Thank you so much for your uh, beautiful work, this, this offering to us here on this Wednesday. Um, so before we start, let's, let's take a, a moment, a, a breath or a soft pause just to gather in this weird internet space together, whatever that means. 
Um, so if you're watching the live stream, I, in, I invite you to join us in just taking a, a breath together before we start. Thank you. So we have a few questions that we're gonna unpack here together. Uh, if you're joining us on the live stream, please feel free to leave some other comments and questions in the chat and we'll be sure to, che to check back. Uh, I remind the artists that are present in the Q&A to introduce yourself before you speak and give a de description and then say end of thought when you're finished. So I'll start with my first question to the artists that are present in the room, which is what new things about your piece did you learn through the access offerings? I want to know what gift did the centering of access give to you uh, as an artist? So I invite any artist to answer this question in, in the way that feels good to them. Feel free to unmute yourself or sign uh, your thoughts. Oh, Courage. Hello, Courage. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you for allowing me to be involved in this event. I feel very honored uh, for being the ASL voice for LAVI. Uh, as a Black artist and identify, it's, it's, it's very nice to see. You know, everyone, every one of the artists showed their beautiful self and it was so accessible. It was wonderful to have sign language captioning along with the spoken language. It was just wonderful. So thank you. Thank you so much, Courage. Thank you. Any other artist that's present in the room? Did you want to speak to the question about what, what things did you learn about your piece through the access offerings? Uh, sure, this is uh, Jane speaking. Uh, I'm a white woman with long blonde hair. I'm wearing glasses uh, and I'm probably a little bit blurry. Bad lighting in here. Um, I think one of the things that it offered me was I am a circus artist, so I normally work in a visual medium, um, but I really wanted to think about how to do something that was uh, accessible auditorily. Um, and so I wrote a poem, which is a totally new medium for me. So that was uh, exciting and uh, interesting and fun to do. So it really pushed me outside of my comfort zone, which was great. Uh, end of thought. Thank you, Jane. Uh, I point now to Elizabeth. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> this is Liz speaking through an interpreter. Uh, because the video is so visual and adding the audio description for the community who are blind or low vision and having the caption in English and also ASL, uh, just, I really enjoyed it. It's so rare to see all those different modalities and having that accessibility to have the ASL with captions. Typically you pick, people tend to pick one or the other. Um, you have to, to decide and it's just an option. So, so end of thought. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elizabeth. I open an invitation to any other artist that's in the room that like to speak to this thought as well. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to our next question. Thank you all again. So my next question is about, um, I'm, I'm curious about what does telling untold stories do to the stories, uh, to you as an artist and to the audience? So I'm gonna post this question also in the chat. So what does telling untold stories do to the stories themselves or to you as an artist or uh, to the audience? And uh, I, I invite any of the artists that haven't engaged with us yet, if you'd like to speak to or sign to this. Um, thank you. End of thought. Uh, courage. Uh, Lavi's poem, uh, you know, it just reminds me to connect with that feeling, you know, as a black person and looking back at the, our ancestors and trying to decolonize our history, uh, Lavi's 
just poem just helped me connect to to my black history and my the values that I hold as a black person and my identity. So it's really made me think a lot. I've been very, very reflective in terms of what Lavi presented and through her poetry and the journey that I'm going on. So it just reminded me that I need to connect to that and what it means to be a black person and how the, you know, my ancestors from Africa and who I am today. Thank you so much, Courage. I invite any other artist that's in the room to uh, connect on this topic. Hi. Oh, Alex has a contribution. I'll go so, after Alex. <laughs> sounds good. So if I could get a host to unmute Alex, that would be very... Am I, am I unmuted? You're unmuted, Alex. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, no, it's a pleasure. Um, it's a great question. Um, I, um, well, I have felt uh, the privilege of being um, taken into um, spaces that I would have not entered before through the stories. You know, it just, it really reminds me of the power of story storytelling. Um, but I think for me, what becomes so um, moving is when it's the personal story in the context of the historical story. And every time the pieces brought uh, that artist's voice into the frame of the history, um, the history became real. So I think that's for me is what is so powerful about uh, the work. You know, we can, I, I could look up and, and, and all of the stories have made me want to like research and understand more of the history, but it's actually, it's the personal, it's the personal voices. It's the artist voices within the context of the history. And that's what these untold stories I think have brought forward for me. So thank you. End of thought. Thank you so much, Alex. Thank you. I'm so happy to, to be in this space with you. Mm, me too. Uh, sorry, I, I didn't catch which other artist was about to speak. I'd invite you to, to also hold some space. Oh, Lavi. Hello, Lavi. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Um, I just saw Alex's name pop up and I thought I would give her some space to, to make her contribution. Um, <clears throat> my name is Lavi Williams. Uh, I am a Black woman. I use the pronouns she and her. Um, <clears throat> and I'm wearing a Black turtleneck sweater uh, with the um, headphones on and I have uh, a, an orange painting of three faces <clears throat> in the background. Um, to Before I answer the question, I just wanted to say thank you to Courage, uh, not only for you know signing as part of uh, my piece um, and supporting that work, but also for um, her words or their words recently um, that um, really... Uh, really um, touched me, I would say, uh, because um, I, it feels like you were really able to tap into the spirit of what I was trying to convey. And so sometimes with, um, at least for me, with, with art and with self-expression, what is in your head doesn't necessarily always translate. Um, in many different ways, whether that's through written, through movement, um, through, um, you know, collaging, putting different pieces together. Um, and so it's really neat and amazing to hear that reflection from somebody else's perspective. Um, and, and it really mirroring where I was trying, where I was coming from and where I'm trying to go. Um, and so I think a really big part of, of uh, telling um, untold stories uh, for the audience, but for the artists as well, is expanding the realm of possibilities uh, for everyone involved. Um, and, you know, there is so much that uh, is um, covered up. <laughs> Uh, for an uncovered, but it's, it, it really is covered up by mainstream society and, and it's covered up by the status quo and we're kind of 
forced um, and conditioned not to think about it too much. Um, when in, in, in actuality, this is where we need to be spending our time and our energy um, in, in our day-to-day -day lives as well as, uh, as, well as in, um, in other aspects of how we, how we live together. Uh, end of thought. Thank you so much, Lavi. That feels like a really perfect moment to uh, say goodbye to all of the folks that are joining us on a live stream. Um, so this is gonna be the end of the live streamed portion. I'm gonna offer another big thank you, big, big round of applause to all of the artists that were involved in the show. And uh, like Lavi just said, go, go out and you know do the work of this show in, in your daily lives uh, in as many ways that you can. So thank you all so much for joining us for, through the live stream. If you are an artist or a guest here in the Zoom call, I invite you to stay. We're gonna continue on this discussion together. Um, but this is the end of the live stream. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Uh, happy Wednesday. Big, big gratitude from, from me here, Mo. Thank you. Thank you.